Okay, hi everybody. All right, so I've had an exciting week. I pray that you all had a pretty decent week or a great week. And I pray that your day today have started off uh, triumphantly and beautifully because mine has. I have many reasons to be glad and to smile and to shout and to just be a good person. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the reasons why we uh, are to be good people. I, I, Every now and again, I have this running thought that Jesus really makes me a better person. And before giving my heart wholeheartedly to the Lord, I always... I always thought of myself as a, uh, pardon me, I always thought of myself as a good person. I always thought of myself as a benevolent person. Um, I was never combative um, or con contentious. Now, I was confrontational, but never really combative or um, contentious. I was um, never a brawler, someone who got into fights. And when I was younger, I would just kind of shy away from fights and, you know, uh, that was just always not a good look for you to shy away from and uh, a challenge. But I was always someone who always uh, sided with what seemed right. And um, as I began to uh, just grow in my awareness and knowledge and understanding of God, the more I realized that first off is Jesus that makes you righteous because um, he died for our sins and he empowers us to do the right things. And we do things by the spirit of God as he leads us. But I also, but he sharpens your identity, your character, your personality. So, you know, outside of God, we, you know, we all have a soulish part of us. We all have a personality. We all have our own characters. And so interacting with someone, even when, um, at times where we can, you know, my husband and I, we like to uh, mimic certain people. To, to kind of like guess who we're talking about. And it's so interesting how we can guess who we're talking about based on how we walk or certain phrases we say or different gestures that we make. So we all have characters and we all have personalities. And I think that's very much a good thing in, in that it shows the creativity of the Lord. But when you come to God, there's a need for him to sharpen your character and to mold your identity to where you are uh, who you are that he created you to be, but in, in the similitude of God in your form, if that makes sense. And so I really am excited in that God makes you a better person. God makes me a better person. And so if I was benevolent, then I'm still benevolent now, but I have a reason as to why I'm benevolent. If I was hospitable, then I can, I'm, I am still hospitable now, then I have a more understanding, a more holy perspective of, of why hospitality is right. Why forgiving is right. Why mercy and patience with other people in their development and their processes growing out of their immaturities is the best thing. Jesus, Jesus gives us the understanding that we need in all of this so that we don't frustrate people's developments and processes and so that we don't disappoint ourselves and others as we just go through this life. And so I was I was thinking of, 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 of several different thoughts, but one thing I really want to talk about is the the there's a passage in Matthew chapter seven, and I believe I believe everyone, saved or unsaved, knows this passage, and we all use it for our advantage. So Matthew chapter 7, judge not lest you be judged for with what you measure, with what, okay, let me start over, I'm, so, I'm excited, so hold on guys. Matthew chapter 7, judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged, and, what, and with what measure you meet, it shall be measured unto you again. Why do you behold the mote that is in your brother's eye and consider not the beam that is in your own eye? Or how will you say to your brother, let me pull out this mote in your eye and behold, a beam is in your own eye. You hypocrite. First, text, first cast out the beam that is in your own eye and then you shall see clearly to cast out the mote that is in your brother's eye. Give not that which is holy to dogs, neither cast you your pearls to swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. 
Ask and it shall be given you. Seek, you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. For everyone that seeks, receives. He that seeks, finds. I'm sorry. For everyone that asks, receives. And he that seeks, finds. And to him that knocks, it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom, if he has a son, asks for bread, will he not give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will he not give him a serpent? If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Here's my emphasis for the day. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them? For this is the law and the prophets. We're going to stop right there. Um, because right after that it goes enter into the straight gates and wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. But I want to talk about how there's a there's a there's a heart that God is cultivating in all the people who are humbly, sincerely serving him. And we all agree with this way. We all agree with this mindset. We all uh, are expecting the, the to see the different changes that manifest in our actions and responses as God is building us a, a, a good heart that is good ground for him to plant good seeds in that can produce good tree and good fruit in the name of Jesus. So as I was thinking on this process, uh, therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men would do to you, do you even also to them? For this is the law and the prophets. I thought, man, do you know that the entire Bible encompasses this verse? Therefore, all things whatsoever you would, even would that men would do to you, do you even also to them? For this is the law and the prophets. What that is saying is you treat people the way that you want to be treated. You treat people the way that God would respond to the person at all times. And as we grow in our ability and our humility and our love to actually become this type of person, you are fulfilling the laws of the Lord, which is really the standards of righteousness. You are uh, walking in the spoken word of God through the prophets of the Lord. I think it's interesting that whenever you can read the gospels, every time you hear the words of Jesus Christ himself, those red words that are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when you read the gospels, you hear how oftentimes if he wasn't being compassionate towards the multitudes, it was him fulfilling some kind of spoken word through the prophets. Many times have I read the, the word of God and it would just say something like Jesus did this as a fulfillment of prophet Isaiah. Isaiah's. And Jesus did this as a pro as a fulfillment of prophet Hosea. And it's just interesting how if Jesus modeled that uh, not one jot or tittle of this word will ever be removed, heaven and earth will pass away, but not one word that has been spoken by God written in the Holy Bible will ever be of non-effect or void or annulled. It tells me that I too should understand the importance of learning Learning the ways of God through the word of God so that when I am living life and I'm making judgments or I'm concluding matters or I'm responding to different adversities and people that it's in line with the word of God like Jesus did. Nothing Jesus did was outside of the precepts of the Lord. Even when the religious leaders of that day try to charge him as a heretic or someone who was causing riots or a blasphemer, nothing Jesus ever said or did in the earth was outside of the laws or the prophets. And that for me excites me because that's more of a reason why I should really learn the words of Jesus Christ, learn what it is that he has taught us through the parables, learn what he has left for us through the different apostles and really eat the word and let it be sweet to my belly and not bitter in the name of Jesus. So as I'm growing in God, one of the things that I want to do is grow in my awareness of God, knowing him on a deeper, more intimate level. And the only way I can do that is constantly agreeing with him. Every time he tells me to do something, I've got to agree that, man, this is the way to eternal life. Every time he tells me to turn from something, I've got to have a mindset that says, man, I agree. Amen. This is what's right to get to eternal life. Every time he 
tells me to disconnect from something or implement something rather. I have to have a, a, a ready heart and a heart that is glad because he hasn't left me to my own devices. He hasn't handed me over to my lust, but he is leading me as a good shepherd leads his sheep into eternal life. The word of God says he leads us beside the still waters and that we have, we can find green pastures. He wants to nourish us up so that we can be well-rounded, deeply rooted people, not superficial, not people that can be observed and someone say within themselves that we're hypocritical, not people who are double-minded and unstable. We have to be people that knows what God is saying. And when we don't know, we can humble ourselves and ask God to let help us to know. Just in prayer today, I was like, Lord, I need your help because that will never not be true. So as I am someone who is in need of mercy, of patience, of kindness, of understanding, of, 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 of forgiveness from God, the word of God says, if I can't forgive people who have offended me, you know, then he can't forgive me because I've offended him many times over. And now right now, right there is like, man, He's asking so much of a people because there is so much reward at the end of this life. And so every time we feel like, man, we just cannot do this. Every time we feel like this is as far as I can go. You got to remember Jesus Christ gave all for you. And it's because here there's treasures laid up for you. And so every time we get to a place where it's like a, a fork in the road, or you feel like you have just met your threshold, or you just feel like it's going to break you or tear you down when you have heard that God is telling you to do something and you just feel like within yourself, you just cannot. That's when you remind yourself that there is nothing ever that the Lord God almighty, the God of our creator, the one who calls himself our father will ever ever require of you that is not going to satisfy a void that you presently have or lead you beside the still waters, the, the pieces that surpasses the understanding, the love that is sufficient for you. There will be nothing that God will ever instruct you to do that will cause you to err, that will cause you to sin, that will cause you to blaspheme. So when he's telling us, don't judge people because the way, the same way you judge people is the same way he's going to judge you that that doesn't mean to just let everything pass that doesn't mean tolerate foolishness that doesn't mean make excuses for other people's sin that's simply saying have a standpoint of righteousness have the mind of Christ be sober in your interactions in handling people because not everyone is where they're supposed to be most people aren't where they're supposed to be but if I can be and loving and kind and gentle and merciful as God is loving and kind towards me and gracious towards me every day, then I am participating in building this person into a well-rounded individual in the Lord God Almighty. So someone falls, my job is to exhort the person daily, encourage them in all righteousness. If I need to correct a matter, I judge it righteously in the name of Jesus, not to take an occasion to destroy people, not to take an occasion to open shame or rebuke someone or to make make the 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 image of God of something different I often remember how when the Lord spoke to Moses he said speak to the rock because the people needed water now these people were stiff neck idolaters they oftentimes did things that were not pleasing to the Lord they needed shepherding. They needed the voice, the audible voice, the physical manifestations and representations of God. And even with all that, it didn't take much for them to sway into what they're familiar with. We call that bondage. And Moses, even though he was leading such rebellious, stubborn people, God gave him a command, speak to this rock. Now, before Moses had to do the same similar things and Moses was allowed to do what he did this time when God spoke to him, which was hit the rock with his staff. But this time, Jesus, the Lord was very particular and specific and wanted done a certain way. God told Moses, speak to the rock. The people frustrated Moses. 
Moses had righteous anger against the people and he was growing weary of their complaining and their murmuring after the fact that they have witnessed and seen such miraculous provision and protection and guidance from the Lord. How can you guys just speak this way? How can you guys behave this way when there's an awesome God who loves you and defends you and fight for you? You know, I can, I, we all can agree that in that hour of, of righteous anger, Moses was right. But God told him to do something a specific way. Speak to this rock. Demonstrate something that these people need to see that they might have not seen before so that they may begin to consider some things. You know, in Romans, the Bible talks about when you're dealing with someone that is like a brute or contentious or or uh, aggressive every time you talk to that person with kindness your words are coupled with the words of kindness every time you you speak in a way that edifies a some someone and not with evil communication every time you give someone a holier perspective and they don't respond you don't respond the way that they deserve the word of god says it's like heaping coals on that person's head so sometimes having to deal with something that isn't right having to exercise patience because you know knowing that your patience is not just developing you into a person that is godly pleasing and acceptable to god it is giving someone who is watching someone who is involved with the hardship and the afflictions that you two are going through another perspective and in the first second third 20 40th time the person may not acknowledge it but i love to imagine that every time we're we're dealing with a person or even the enemy and we respond according to the ways of God as we grow aware of how God wants us to be. I want to believe it's like peeling back layers because we're trying to get to the core of a matter. We're trying to get to a core of a person. So today, if I have to pull back another layer and I feel like, God, I don't have any more grace, I got to know and remember who fills my cup. Where does my help come from? Who provides a way of escape? Okay, if I can refresh my mind on those types of things, I am rooted and I am grounded on the Lord, which is my sure foundation. So it's not going to be it's not going to cause me to give up because I need to pull back layers because someone's going to have a testimony behind this. Someone's going to see the Lord God Almighty behind this. Someone's going to repent from what they thought was right behind this. So Moses, speak to the rock. People need to see something different. People need to experience the gentleness, the kindness, the meekness, the love of God, the forgiveness of God, although they don't deserve it. Although they deserve the wrath of God, speak to this rock, Moses. And Moses in that moment struck the rock out of anger. He did it before. It was fine. They're still the same people that he did it yesterday for. But today there's a new thing that God wants to do. There's a new, there's a new stage of development that God wants to implement here. Moses, you have been gifted with the responsibility to be the hand of God, the, 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 the representation of God. The word of God said that Aaron would be like Moses' prophet and Moses would be like their God to the people, meaning Moses is a representation of godliness in heaven. So that's why godly leadership is important in the homes, in the church, in the government. If we don't have godly leadership, then every other structure beneath that is going to break down and fail in the name of Jesus. So when Moses did not speak to the rock, but rather judge the people, judge the matters, concluded that, no, this was worthy of me smiting the rock. The Lord said, because you failed to sanctify me in the eyes of the people, the consequence ultimately is that you're going to lead them all the way to the, the promised land flowing with milk and honey. You're going to fight all these battles. You're going to establish all of the covenants. You're going to establish all of the elders and the priests and, and structures of how to serve God in on earth as it is in heaven. You're, I'm going to even let you stand at the brink of that promised land, but you're not going to be able to step foot in it. That's harsh. For the meekest man on earth. That's harsh. For the most obedient person. We could read it in the word of God. That's harsh. For a sacrificial person. That gave up all. To serve the Lord. Based on the grace of God. And the call of God on, of his life. Because of these people. 
I can't enter into eternal, into the promised land. That says something great because he failed to sanctify God in the people's eyes. That was a bad misrepresentation of a, of a, of, of God. That was a, you, Moses was someone who spoke to God face to face. Moses had to even let the people know, like, you know, I speak to y'all through dreams and visions and things like that. But I speak, I speak to Moses face to face to just kind of let them know that there's a variance between the two of you guys. There's a variance between Moses and the multitudes, but the same one that got to be able to see God's backside, the same one that was in the mount as he was receiving holy things from God, that when he came down, his countenance shined and people had to veil his eyes. The same one, because he failed to sanctify God in the eyes of the people, was the one that could not partake in the promise of the land flowing with milk and honey. That right now has got to put somebody's hands up. And say, you know what, God, I am not willing to relinquish, forfeit, lose, miss out on anything that you have for me in this life that you said I can have because I am misunderstanding how to handle people. I'm misunderstanding what you're saying my response should be in a hard time. I've got to love God with my heart, mind, soul, and strength. And I've got to love my neighbor as myself because I love how God puts that together as a fulfillment of the law and of the prophets. If you know how to love God truly, it will, it will enable you to love others truly. And in that you're not going to steal from anybody. You're not going to covet anyone's goods. You're not going to be envious and jealous of anyone. You're not going to defraud or bear false witness against anyone. You're not going to commit adultery. You're going to handle your children with care. You're not going to bow your hearts to graven images or different people and things because you love the Lord. You're going to defaultly do what is right in God's eyes and you're going to be pleasant and encouraging to other people around you and that's why God will tell us things like don't judge people because we don't know how to judge like God judges so again we're not saying when people are in sin just enable it um, receive it and 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 allow it I'm saying we don't have the heart like God has I can take my children I have two girls and there's a great gap between them. There's a 13 year old gap. So praise God. My oldest is 17 years old today. And I have a three year old who's going to be four years old on the 30th. And although they love each other and they are siblings, they got the same mother, they got the same father. They even resemble each other. There is a nurturing that the oldest doesn't have for the youngest. There's a patience. There's a kindness. There's an understanding of how to handle the youngest that the oldest doesn't have. And there's a respect and an honor and a reverence that the youngest doesn't have for the oldest. That as parents in the Lord is striving to teach the oldest how to love, to be patient, to serve and be a godly example to the youngest. And to the youngest, you better learn what submission is. You better learn what obedience is. You got to know what not talking back to your elders look like so that we are building up a godly legacy in the name of Jesus. So that this house, God is dwelled to please in it. So I'm seeing it from that standpoint, even in that, like you can have family that siblings who love each other, but don't know how to handle each other because they don't have the heart of the parent. They don't have the perspective of the parent. They don't understand crucial points of development. So God is saying, listen, I've worked hard to pull certain individuals out of darkness to put them in the light. I've sent many angels. There have been many intercessors that has worked this person's way into the sheepfold don't you dare mess it up because you lack the patience you lack the understanding you lack the compassion that jesus had on the multitude by trying to rebuke someone prematurely by trying to take something off of someone or take something from the person without having anything to replace it prematurely don't judge lest you be judged because the same measure you meet on someone else you got you're gonna have that same judgment respond back on you because god is holy and he's just that way he's not gonna allow you to mishandle someone else and why he treats you with gentle mercies and loving kindness he 
He's not going to allow you to experience mercies from him while you are being merciless to another. That's why one of the major beatitudes is blessed are you when you are merciful for you shall obtain mercy. I love it. God forces us to love one another, be kind for one to one another, forgiving one another. He forces us that the way to serve God is to be unified and to treat each other with a, with a reverence for him. King David, when he messed up with Bathsheba and uh, conspired to kill Bathsheba's husband, and Joab helped and different people were, were aware of that. And even uh, certain nations heard of what David did, King David did. You know, God had to deal with that because it forced different people to question because he's a leader. And it forced different nations to blaspheme God. It became a very shameful thing. So that's going to be, God is going to be responsive because there's a need to protect his holy name. Not because... Where we can take anything from God and that he's afraid of us is that for our sake, his name must be defended and justified. And so prophet Nathan came in and gave King David this parable. It was so strategic. You got to be wise. So, so gentle as a serpent, uh, gentle as a dove, wise as a serpent. Prophet Nathan, someone who is under subjection to King David, but heard from God and knows the matter goes to King David strategically led by the spirit of God and begins to present to King David the matter in a parable about a parable about this you know, old, this poor man had this ewe lamb and he loved this ewe lamb and he raised this ewe lamb like a daughter. It's been a while since I read that specific passage, so I'm going to paraphrase it. He raised this ewe lamb like its own daughter. And one day this rich, wealthy, powerful person came somehow got a hold of the ewe lamb took the ewe lamb and killed the ewe lamb. And prophet Nathan continued on with the parable and presented it before King David, who has been able to righteously divide and righteously judge matters of the kingdom and the people. So here you go, man of God, and you have the grace to judge this matter. Here's this matter. And King David, when he heard what he thought was a case, but rather was a parable, he, he was, he was, Angry at the fact that someone who had authority or power did such an evil act to someone who felt, to someone who had less, to someone who practically would be overlooked in society. You know, God, I can even say that David was offended that this old, this uh, rich man would trod this poor man under his foot that way. So King David's judgment was that this man would pay back X amount of dollars, I believe, and then the man would die because that was just atrocity, atrocity. That was monstrosity. I heard my husband say that re realistic. You know, that was diabolical of this man to do that to that poor man. And so when King David rendered his judgment, you know, at some point, Nathan was like, you know, because King David was like, who is this dude? And, and the prophet Nathan was like, you are that person. You are that person. And because that's the way you would judge it, God is going to respond in agreement with you. Now you're not going to die, but the son that was conceived in this conspiracy, you can't keep. So the son is going to die. That's an example that keeps me humble and patient and kind and forgiving whenever something in life that just isn't right happening happens because the way I respond, the way I judge, what I utter out of my mouth, God is going to record it, especially if I got problems. So that's why he would say, you hypocrite, first, first take out the speck that is in your own eye so that you should see clearly to remove, well, take out the beam that is in your eye. Then you shall see clearly to cast out the speck that is in your brother's eye. So my brother who I'm looking at, God is saying, got less problems than you that's looking at him, judging him. The brother that you're trying to rebuke or that sister or that friend or that family member or that coworker or, or, or a governmental authority that you disagree with or celebrity on TV that you, you disagree with. God is saying your issues are bigger than the person next to you. Focus on what you got going on. You got this big old log in your eye. 
And so much that there is no way you got the right perspective. There's no way you got the right vision. There's no way you understand enough to go help someone remove a speck in their own eye. You got a big old log in your eye. You got some problems of the heart. You got some problems in your awareness of God. You got problems in life. And God is saying, deal with those issues. Because if you could deal with those issues, then you are in position to help other people. That's why he can define the office of a bishop in 1 Timothy. You've got to be a husband of one wife. Your children got to be in subjection. Your your wife has got to be orderly. You can't be a brawler. You can't be a liar. You can't be uh, many different things. Because if you can somehow lead a godly house, if you can somehow overcome your weaknesses in your character and, and, and magnify and exalt the life through your lifestyle, through your posture and your disposition, then you are qualified to help somebody with their spec because you have put forth effort to remove that log out of your own eye. And in that, though, therefore, therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, you do even to them, for this is the law and the prophets. If I need someone to forgive me and do it quickly, I've got to be someone who can forgive and forgive quickly. If I'm someone who would love for someone to be there for me when I'm down and out, I've got to be the kind of person that is there for others wisely when they are down and out. If I am someone who needs someone to hear a case before they judge it and not just be one-sided, I've got to be someone who can do as God told us in Deuteronomy, hear both sides of a matter before judging the situation so that I am a righteous judge. If I'm someone who doesn't want people to conspire against me by taking bribes or or walking in favoritism and taking a side of a brother or a wife or or an, or or confidant, then I've got to be someone is no 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 no. What's right is right and what's wrong is wrong. So I don't take bribes. I don't take your side because you my wife or you my husband or you my sister or you my best friend. I according to the Lord has a has got a job as a as a godly representation of Him on earth. And so you know nature teaches you some things. You're gonna go to the courthouse whether they I have gotten truck case um charges on you and got falls out witnesses and evidences on you, the judge is going to hear the plaintiff's side and the defendant's side. And the jury is going to take all of the evidence of what they have heard, what they have seen that was presented to them, and they're going to weigh it. And they're going to wait and then they're going to conclude before the witnesses in that courtroom, before the judge and the, the defendant and the plaintiff, who they rule for. That's nature. That's the world. And God is the same, the same thing. There has to be a way that the people of God maneuver, operate, respond so that it calls the hand of God to be obvious in your life. That's what keeps you blessed. That's what keeps you at peace. Jesus lastly was faced with a matter about the Sabbath. And up until there were certain points where the Pharisees were just bent on concluding and trying to prove or dis, def, defraud or discredit Jesus by trying to make him a, a lawbreaker. That's the best strategy of the enemy. If you are doing something that can destroy the works of hell and Satan himself, what he's going to do is falsely accuse you and cause all manner of offenses and accusations against you. He's the accuser of the brethren. That is one of the the most effective strategies that the devil has. If I can somehow smear your image, somehow destroy your name, that's what you do in in the world. If you want to destroy someone that is powerful in the world, destroy their image. So they were doing that to Jesus. They did that to Paul. People do that to believers. So Jesus um, was dealing with that with these religious leaders. Because they wanted the people to stop listening to him and stop following him. And so there's this case where it was in Matthew chapter 12. And I'm going to read at verse 9. It says, and when he had departed from there, he went into their synagogues. And behold, there was this man which had a withered hand. And he asked Jesus saying, is it? And they asked Jesus, the leaders asked Jesus saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? That they may accuse him. That they may accuse Jesus is why they ask. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Because they know the heart of Jesus is to have compassion. So you see someone with a need. He's not going to shut up his bowels of compassion. So if I have grace and power and the approval of the Lord to heal people that are sick. 
so that they may draw closer to the Lord and be a, a light in the earth. Why not? So they most likely knew that Jesus was going to try to bless this man's life and change this man's life forever. So they want to be a stumbling block. Is it lawful to heal people on the Sabbath? Because you have a law that you should not do anything on the Sabbath, but rest. And Jesus said to them, what man shall be there among you? So now it's the heart. We're going to attack and address the heart, not the superficial issues. No, there's a, you are, you're a care. You have a personality, a character and it's flawed. And so when we read the word, it confronts the flawed nature. It confronts the fallen way of a person so that we can realign with God. So his response to, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? His judgment was, and he says to them, what man shall be there among you that shall have one sheep? And if it falls into the pit on a Sabbath day, will not lay hold on it and lift it up. How much then a man better than a sheep, better than a sheep. Wherefore, is it lawful to do well on the Sabbath day? So he, he, he counteracts with, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Well, first of all, you hypocrites, if you got good things that you love, that has your heart, that you know, that keeps you at a place of prosperity, falls into a pit like a sheep. Now, don't act like, oh, because it's the Sabbath day, I'll see you the next day. Hopefully it doesn't die or a wolf doesn't get it. No, you're going to do something to save that sheep. And Jesus is saying, we're better. Your friend, your neighbor, your sibling, your coworker, people who have not tasted and seen <clears throat> that the Lord is gracious needs the perfected love of Christ to be operating in us as they interact with us. So he said, we're better than the possessions. We're better than the riches of this life. And so where you may have a different perspective as someone who's not willing to lay down their lives for the sheep, Jesus knows, listen, I'm willing to, I'm going to die for these people. I love them. So when I speak evil against them, when I say Satan get behind me, that's from another place. You, there's an alternative. There's, there's, there's a, there's an ulterior motive. There's a heart that does not understand what God is doing. God's desire is not anyone perishes. So Jesus says to the man, stretch forth your hand. And he stretched forth his hand and it was restored whole like to the other. And the Pharisees went out and held a council against Jesus, how they might destroy him because Jesus attacked their heart. Yeah, did confront them with their conditions of their heart. And then Jesus turned back, healed the man. Their response to that wasn't humility. Man, that's true. I don't care about people. I don't care about sal their, their salvation. I don't care about people's developments necessarily. I don't care that this just hurt somebody or this word just broke something necessary or this just caused somebody to go deeper into bondage of insecurities and fear or pride. I didn't, I don't care because the humility would cause you to slow, slow down and consider if I say this to somebody, is this going to hurt or better the person? They didn't care. They just conspired on how they were going to destroy Jesus. And that we all have the potential of doing to each other and against the Lord. And I'm saying, be mindful today because you have problems and you are someone who is in need of a saving hand of God. You sin every day. Sometimes you're sinning without realizing it. And it's the mercies of God that brings things to your attention so that you can grow out of it. It's by grace through faith we are saved, not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, lest the many, any man should boast. He said, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the word of God. While you were still in your mess, while you still had the same mentality, while you still did not deserve anything good from anybody, Jesus Christ paid the way. And he knows you by name. He says he knows the very hairs on your head. He loves you. So we ought to be patient, merciful, and kind to others because he loves them. And he's gone through great lengths for them. So let's not dare mess up the work or the image of God by not respecting the fact that God, Jesus Christ, died for you and for somebody else. And so we love people. We are patient with one another. We understand God. So today, as you gain wisdom, gain understanding, 
Get knowledge, get wisdom, and ask God to make you humble. Ask God to give you more love. Ask God to give you more patience. Ask God to open up your eyes so that you can see through eye lenses of Jesus Christ. Help, ask God to help you to pick up your cross and to follow after him daily. Ask God to be the one that has a friend that can lay his life down for. No greater love than he who has a friend that will lay his life down for the friend. I love that. I want to be the person that can lay her, my, lay her life down for another person, not just for my family, but for someone who Jesus died for because it will lead someone to eternal life. I'm wanting to give more of myself to that. And I'm admonishing and encouraging and supporting that you all do the same. I challenge someone today to put down the offenses, put down the frustrations, put down the aggravations and say, yes, God, I'm going to peel back another layer today. Today, I'm going to peel back another layer by putting on a smile on my face in front of someone who don't deserve it. I'm going to pull back another layer by handshaking someone or giving somebody a hug or giving someone a kind response that I might have not spoken to in a little while. I'm going to peel back those layers because, you know, people are on their way to destruction. Many people are on the way to damnation. And you and your smiling today might cause someone to, con to consider the error of their ways. You saying, I love you today or change your disposition and your facial expression today might be the heap of coal on someone's head to turn them about face to Jesus. It's not about you. Never will be. It's not even about them. It's all about the Lord. And I praise God today for a godly perspective. I challenge you today. Continue peeling back those layers in your life and in someone else's life in Jesus name.